Neighbors say a cockroach will not survive something, and he is Donald J. Cockroach. And all that he said, he could deny tomorrow. There is no conscience, there is no belief system, there is no guilt, there is no truth, there is only the nearest hole in the floorboard for Donald J. Cockroach to scuttle through. Nevertheless, the only people Trump managed to convince that he is opposed to a nationwide abortion ban are those who support a nationwide abortion ban, the ones who now feel he has betrayed them. The people Trump managed to convince that he will not stand in the way of a nationwide abortion ban are those who oppose a nationwide abortion ban. In other words, he got it all exactly backwards. Trump took one of the few straightforward policy positions of his wasted life, one of his few commitments, as wrong as it is, as morally indefensible as it is, it was a rallying cry for his most fervent supporters, the evangelicals and the handmade crowd. He took that and he lawyered it, he finessed it, he filled it full of poison pills, and he trumped it like he might trump your bill at Trump University. And he tried to make it say yes and no at the same time, and the evangelicals finally realized he has been playing them, and they do not know what to expect from him next. The phrase on the religious nut job right yesterday and today has been, he has sold us out. Before his crazy abortion video statement, that gained him nothing from the middle and only further rage from the left. Trump told the evangelicals in writing that he, quote, like most other Republicans, believe in exceptions for rape, incest, and life of the mother, unquote. They don't. We have an obligation, he told them, to win elections, unquote. They don't. They believe he won because God counted the votes this time. They believe they won. They believe God won or Jesus or I I don't know. They believe he was just the empty vessel chosen to get Roe v. Wade repealed. And if anybody ever better fit the definition of an empty vessel than cockroach J. Trump, I don't know who it is. He told them that he might have lied to them about this, that he might lie to them again, might be lying to them now, might be lying to them about the future just to get elected. The Susan B. Anthony Pro-Life America organization attacked Trump after that video. Mike Pence attacked Trump. Kevin Bloody Sorbo attacked Trump. It was such a blunder, such an obvious blunder, such a potentially unsalvageable blunder that even Lindsey Graham noticed. Even Lindsey Graham, who is being blackmailed to support Trump at all costs and to threaten riots in the streets in Trump's defense, being blackmailed with God only knows what, he said Trump was wrong. The Supreme Court, quote, does not require that conclusion legally, and the pro-life movement has always been about the well-being of the unborn child, not geography, unquote. That is the closest that Lindsey Graham will get for the rest of his natural life to telling cockroach J. Trump to go F himself. It is not, however, the closest that the evangelicals and the anti-woman and the forced birth crowds will get to telling Trump to go F himself. And incredibly, that may not be the biggest part of Trump's biggest blunder yet. Beyond alienating his most fervent base, there are three background consequences to Trump's remarkable strategic disaster on abortion, which might, in the long term, be even more important than this obvious one. And the first one is, for the first time, the gullibility The lack of intelligence, the lack of analytical reasoning on the part of America's primary news outlets is working against Trump. Trump says abortion law should be left to the states, was the New York Times headline. He never said that. He says it will be left to the states, which is accurate. It is left to the states. Now that's the law. 
He never said a damn thing about the future. He never said a damn thing about whether or not if the Republicans in the House and Senate managed to get into position to pass a national ban superseding all state control, if a national abortion ban of 16 weeks, 15 weeks or six weeks or whatever gets to his desk, he never said he'd veto it. He never said he'd veto it because it should be left to the states. He never said that. He never said anything like that. And it's in the Times headline. Trump draws his line in the sand, was the headline in the conservative Washington Examiner. Abortion laws should be left up to the states. Where did he say that? He said they are. This is fine print. He lives in the fine print. Congratulations, Washington Examiner. You two have just bought 44,000 Trump stakes at $100 apiece. Trump promises abortion rights will be decided by states if re-elected, sidestepping national ban, reads the New York Post. Also moronic. But the best is the one at CNN. Trump makes his stance on abortion clear. And that's what the evangelicals believe. For once, the manifold journalistic failures and personal irresponsibilities of America's reporters too gutless to push past Trump's self-created storylines, they're going to kill him in the polls and at the ballot box, absolutely kill him. Again, that part of this nation that already hates Trump over Roe v. Wade and the packing of the theocratic Supreme Court and only heard these imbecilic headlines parroting Trump's transparent, yes, repeat, no, they heard only this. Yeah, the states can ban abortion any way they like. They heard ban abortion, Trump. Trump ban abortion. If they look deeper than that, They realized it's not just laissez-faire, let the states decide. Trump won't guarantee that if made president again, he would use the power he would have to stop a national ban. And he said nothing about Mifepristone. And he repeated the reproductive health equivalent of the blood libel, the QAnon-level Pizzagate-worthy lie that Democrats, quote, support even execution after birth. That's exactly what it is. The baby is born. The baby is executed after birth, unquote. That's the psychotic, what people who already are fighting Trump on this issue alone, that's the Trump they heard. Those who are supporting Trump on this issue alone, or were supporting him, heard babies are being executed after birth by Democrats, and I, Trump, will not do anything to stop it. And if Trump didn't screw up enough by telling that to his reporters the spine of his base, the irreplaceable part of his base, every low synapse count reporter and editor in America just put that message in big black capital letters everywhere. Trump won't do what you guys want. So the first sub-headline here, thank you, American news media, for not listening to my demands that you go back to being, you know, reporters instead of stenographers especially when covering a con man who is trying to say yes and no and up and down and abortion ban and no abortion ban and all at the same time. Thank you. Now, the second subheadline here is, why did Trump say any of this right now? Why suddenly Sunday night did he put out that feeble social media post warning the unmovable, unthinking objects of the religious right that they were going to have to compromise on this and he was going to tell them exactly how much they were going to have to compromise the next day? Somebody, somewhere, even inside the Trump idiocracy, must have realized that any statement not giving the evangelicals everything they wanted at least stood the chance of damaging his campaign, and rather severely at that. Certainly one of his flying monkeys, like Stephen Miller, had to have seen the blowback online Sunday night, the he's going to sell us out, isn't he? The horrified realization across the land of ecstatic visions and eclipses as messages from a deity rather than a life-size geometry quiz, which is what they are. They must have seen this. 
So the second subheadline is somebody in the Trump campaign saw all that before or after and said, no, we got to do this. We got to do this anyway. Full steam ahead. And they said that because all campaigns, even the ones like Trump's that are actually just fronts for legal GoFundMes, all of them have internal polling data. And the Trump internal polling data must show, must show. This politically suicidal video of his confirms it must show that he is getting destroyed on abortion and especially on a national abortion ban. And that if he didn't do something to distance himself from a national ban, immediately he will lose the election over it. Will lose. There's no other inference. Trump could have happily gone along letting the evangelicals believe he was fully theirs. He was their messenger or their vessel or their vehicle, baby. He can take you anywhere you want to go. He didn't have to clarify that. He didn't have to clarify that at all. To go back to yesterday's moronic headlines, no line in the sand, Washington Examiner. No making his abortion stand clear, CNN. He could have skated through to Election Day being all things to all people. We're not talking about the best and the brightest here. Instead, he grabbed the third rail on the second Monday of April of the campaign. More than 200 days out, he grabbed the third rail with both hands and then he licked it. The internal polling and other research inside the Trump campaign must have said, if you support any kind of national abortion ban, in fact, if you do not unsupport any kind of national abortion ban, you will lose. You will lose by too much to even be able to lie that you had it stolen from you. You will lose by 200 electoral votes. That's what his own polling on an abortion ban and the topic in general must have said. The only other explanation for this statement, at this time, alienating his friends and enraging his enemies, is that a man who has spent his life faking it, fudging it, conning the yokels about it, that man would suddenly say something designed to leave the impression that he was against a federal ban, is that he suddenly decided that after this lifetime of never making a definitive statement, never not living inside the fine print, never seeing a scam he didn't like or try, that suddenly on Sunday night, he decided he wanted to be upfront and honest with everybody. Upfront and honest cockroach J. Trump. I'm skeptical. The most important part, of course, is Trump's campaign, and maybe it really didn't have any choice but to do it, revealed its greatest fear and revealed it to the Biden campaign. Trump is going to get destroyed on the overturning of Roe v. Wade in general and the prospect of a national abortion ban specifically. That's what their own research must indicate. So Biden campaign put it on a big giant bell. Trump killed Roe v. Wade. You're doing a lot of it now. Do 10 times as much. Do a thousand times as much. Have the Trump campaign wading knee deep in it. And hang the bell around Trump's neck. You have 211 days. A commercial in every TV show, on every streamer, on every podcast. Trump killed Roe v. Wade. Which leads me to the third subheadline here. You know who else now knows that? You know who else just visualized belling the Trump? Robert F. Kennedy Jr. As he presently exists in this presidential race, he has the capacity to sink Joe Biden or sink Donald Trump. His New York State campaign director has repeatedly spoken of taking away enough electoral votes from Biden to throw the election to the House of Representatives and thus she assumes to Trump. The video that came out yesterday, that's not the first time she said that. She posted that as early as January. But whatever she said, in the last few weeks, every move Bob Kennedy himself has made has alienated anybody who ever thought for a second that their choice was Kennedy or Biden. Kennedy has claimed Biden threatened democracy and Trump didn't. 
He has claimed the prosecution of the January 6th insurrectionists was politically motivated and that they were mere activists and that he would appoint a special counsel to investigate the prosecutors. So what is RFK Jr. going to do with this Trump abortion video? I mean, it's clear that Trump only bobs to the surface of reality once, maybe twice a week. And my former friend, Bob Kennedy Jr., less frequently than that. But he has been staggering over towards being the other option to Trump voters, not to Biden voters. And here Trump just said no national abortion ban, or he seemed to say that. Last summer, August, Bob Kennedy said he was in favor of a 15-week federal ban. Then he retracted it quickly and said he misheard the question. And, you know, with the number of voices in his head, that is absolutely goddamn possible. Then he picked a running mate who is pro-choice but calls in vitro fertilization IVF a lie and says women should instead expose themselves to sunlight for two hours a day to get pregnant. And I'm guessing then mate only with those nude men in the Tucker Carlson videos who were shown tanning their tiny little tuckers. What if Kennedy now comes out for a national abortion ban? I mean, he's said it before. I mean, he said everything before. And like Trump, he is unburdened by human guilt or doubt or the sense that he'd need to explain not just a 180 on any given topic, but a 360. But if he is really tacking not to be the anti-Biden, but the anti-Trump, this would be a gift from Trump to hurt Trump. Now, again, nothing Trump has ever said or done or been in his life is important enough to him that he cannot contradict it, repudiate it, and deny it tomorrow. The fact that he is not really a human being and thus not burdened by guilt or shame or memory makes that easier. Cockroaches survive. The Trump 2024 presidential campaign is about a cockroach trying to survive. He could erase all this tomorrow or try to. As Chuck Schumer said yesterday, let's wait a few weeks and see what his new position will be. But I don't think even this cockroach can run away fast enough from this stunning mistake. And from what Kennedy can do with this stunning mistake. And especially what the Biden campaign can do with this stunning mistake. Self-destroying strategic moves, alienating all sides about abortion may come and go, but the campaign as cover for cockroach J. Trump keeping his ass out of prison continues eternally. The Stormy Daniels hush money election interference trial starts next Monday. Trump, who has lost all appeals in the case, is now essentially filing a suit against the judge under seal because... eh, Judge Juan Mershon is not doing an Eileen Cannon impression. It's an odd thing to do three days after Trump urged the same judge to jail him and make him into a modern Nelson Mandela. Making the Mandela analogy is just as odd a thing, given that the great South African leader spent 27 years in jail. And if Juan Mershon can put Trump in jail for 27 years, I'll call that a win. Also from the If You Missed It file, Trump posted a video on his site in which he tried to apply jujitsu to a very, very unlikely and sensitive topic. Namely, the topic of people calling him Hitler. Quoting the author uh, Klingon something, Another Hitler, they say. Elect him and he will be a dictator. We should take this hysteria as reason for hope. The America haters rightly fear that he and his party are on the threshold of a successful counter-revolution. Yeah, that's what humanity has taken away from the story of the life and death of Hitler, that he was a counter-revolutionary. Two responses to that bid to rename Dulles International outside Washington in memory of, I'm sorry, in honor of Trump. Congressman Jerry Connolly and Jared Moskowitz said, good idea, wrong venue. They want to put Trump's name not on an airport, but on Miami's Federal Correctional Institute. And a software engineer named Alex Cole has a different idea for renaming Dulles. 
call it Dwight Eisenhower International Airport, or simply by its acronym, DEI. In Sunday's warm-up to the abortion fiasco video, Trump invoked death and destruction again, first time in a while for that. And in the span of two days, Trump insisted that President Biden had delivered the State of the Union while under the influence of cocaine and that the president had, quote, soiled the resolute desk in the Oval Office. The New York Times buried that allegation in paragraph 19. Maggie Haberman writes, quote, Trump's remark was interpreted as the former president saying that Mr. Biden had defecated on the desk. No, 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 no. no. That was Ted Nugent. Also of interest here in an all-new edition of the podcast, is there a skeezier, greedier, slimier, more despicable celebrity than Dwayne Johnson, The Rock? And when, CBS, did you put out the story about the recall of some of the eclipse glasses? When? Plus, I have never revealed this before. But I once not only saw a ghost, but I know exactly who it was and why he was laughing at me. That's next. This is Countdown. This is Countdown with Keith Olbermann. us on this all new edition of countdown it's another trip down memory lane with things i promised not to tell all it is is a cassette tape from february 1977 and an overnight sports cast i did on a real radio station in binghamton new york and oh by the way it served as the reminder of the day 20 years later when i saw a ghost and i knew exactly who it was And I have never told anybody about it until now. First, still more idiots to talk about. The daily roundup of the miscreants, morons, and Dunning-Kruger effect specimens who constitute today's worst persons in the world. That was for Joe Flaherty. We start with the bronze, worse, CBS News. CBS News reported that the Illinois Department of Public Health was warning residents about a recall of eclipse glasses, bikini solar eclipse glasses sold by at least six different retailers in Illinois, including the Perry County Grocery Marketplace in Pinckneysville. They were supposed to protect you against going blind by looking into the sun during that eclipse yesterday, and you should return them right away because they've been recalled, and CBS put the story out at noon Illinois time yesterday, like an hour and a half before the eclipse. Good call. I got plenty of time then, huh? When are you moving that story about how I should return my 1959 Ford Edsel after it was recalled? Huh? The runner up, or sir, I really do enjoy much of the work of many of the people who remain there repeat performances on this list time and time again and none more so than harris faulkner i really enjoy her work on fox quote news unquote not in the way she intends it of course but few combine the majesty of her blinkered stupidity with total self-unawareness but i hadn't quite put my finger on the exact problem in the canon of harris faulkner and then yesterday in one sentence she explained it to me A Biden spokesman who appears to be an African-American responded to the Trump fundraiser at Mar-a-Lago over the weekend by saying it was full of a bunch of billionaires, scammers, extremists, and racists. Kaylee McEnany, another Fox performer who is not the proverbial sharpest tool in the shed, although she is a tool, and I think they in fact don't even leave her in the shed. Kaylee McEnany responded that Who was the racist that was there? Tim Scott was there. Vivek Ramaswamy, Woody Johnson, Wilbur Ross, Steve Wynn. Which is when the legendary Harris Faulkner said it. 
and said it all, quote, I want to say this. So they bring out the black surrogate to talk about racism because apparently the people that you just listed on that list, they're all black, but they're not Democrats, unquote. As a reminder, that list consisted of Tim Scott, Vivek Ramaswamy, Woody Johnson, Wilbur Ross, former Secretary of Commerce who's more than 3,000 years old, and Steve Wynn, the Vegas gambling guy who once backed through an old master's. And not a cigar, an actual painting. Steve Wynn. The list is Tim Scott, Vivek Ramaswamy, Woody Johnson, Wilbur Ross, and Steve Wynn. According to Harris Faulkner, they're all black. Woody Johnson. Thank you, Harris Faulkner, for explaining this. But our winner, uh, an even uglier Johnson, Dwayne The Rock Johnson. I always wondered why they called him The Rock, and now I got the answer. It's a description of his head. Dwayne Johnson went on Fox and said he would not be repeating his 2020 endorsement of Joe Biden and not Trump, and for several days it was the lead story. Johnson will not endorse Biden will not endorse against Trump. That was the lead story. Quoting him in his appearance that started this, the endorsement that I made years ago with Biden was one I thought was the best decision for me at the time. I thought I'm in this position where I have some influence, and I felt it was my job then to exercise my influence. I was then the most followed man in the world and am today, and I appreciate that. But what that caused was something that tears me up in my guts, which is division. That got me. I didn't realize that then, unquote. What the hell is he talking about? Division? Well, Dwayne Johnson was on Fox to promote his return to this WrestleMania thing, WWE. And when he says division, he means some of his fans got mad at him for opposing Trump, and that presumably has shown up in his bank account. Wrestling is real. They actually do throw each other around. But we seem to have forgotten that the rest of it, and everybody in it, is fake. As fake as Dwayne Johnson. And as cowardly. And as stupid. Interactive Polls, which is tied to that polymarket gambling site I cited last week, had it Trump 43-41 in February. Now they have it Biden 43-40. That is a five-point swing. Even after a Rasmussen poll, the Republicans who founded ESPN then sold it for like $70 and some magic beans. Even with that measured in, which had Trump up by eight, the real clear politics poll of polls, which is itself a right-leaning statistic, it has Trump now up by three-tenths of one point. The conservative real clear politics RCP poll. So, Mr. The Rock... Nice job to get on the sinking ship just in time so everybody will remember your cowardice if and when Biden wins. Dwayne Johnson trying to avoid division. Division of himself from a few million dollars in income. That kind of division. See, he made $270 million in 2022, but less than half of that last year, according to Forbes. So you can see that the financial division is just killing him. And he can't have any more of this costly, damaging concern for his country. Dwayne The Rock, division no, $270 million, yes, Johnson. Today's Weist, Pison, and the world! The number one story on the countdown on my favorite topic, me and I once saw a ghost. I have never talked about this before, not publicly anyway, but I once saw a ghost. And it wasn't one of these vague things where you're not sure what you're seeing or who you're seeing. I know exactly who the ghost was. I will get to this story, but first, the setup requires a cassette tape I found that dates from... February 1977. And the damnedest thing about this cassette tape is, if you're familiar at all with cassette tapes, they used to have little pinholes at the top, little pieces of plastic that you were supposed to break out or break off or punch through 
after you were done recording on the tape so you could not accidentally record over the tape. And when I found this cassette the other day, these little things that you had to make not intact anymore were still intact. So this tape has survived not only intact since 1977, but it has not been accidentally erased, even though I left it eligible to be accidentally erased every day since February 1977. And it contains, among other things, the voice of the ghost. The setup here is the radio station involved is called WINR in Binghamton, New York. The man you will hear calling himself Tom Daniels is actually named Glenn Cornelius. He called himself Tom Daniels because that's what the jingle package said. And they had a variety of Tom Daniels's over the years at WINR in Binghamton. He was our friend, Glenn, who worked at WVBR, the Cornell radio station I have mentioned umpteen thousand times on this podcast. He was going to be the program director and tried to become the general manager of the station, and he was my original frenemy. Best friends, helped me out in a thousand different situations as I did he, and we once had a fist fight over a girl. He won the girl, and of course, that turned out to be the best thing he ever did for me. But that's another story for another time, as they say. So Glenn is portraying Tom Daniels, and one weekend in the winter of 1977, he brought his friends, me, Peter Shacknow, and Pat Lyons, that's now Patrick J. Lyons, executive foreign desk editor of the New York Times, he brought the three of us down there with him to see a real radio station, and he put Peter and I on the air, Peter doing a newscast and me doing a sportscast. The only part of this, before I play this tape, that requires a setup is the explanation of the vitamin B12 joke. Peter used to introduce me on the newscast at WVBR, and he used to ask me a trivia question every Tuesday and got so frustrated in my always getting the answers to his trivia questions that he changed the trivia question from a sports trivia question to a question the answer to which was vitamin B12. And I didn't get it. And it became a running joke inside the studios of WVBR for quite a while. That's the setup. And then there is the additional detail that Glenn Cornelius, portraying Tom Daniels on this next tape, was the ghost I saw. 16 minutes after 1 o'clock in the morning on a Sunday, which is now February 20th, 1977. My name is Tom Daniels, and I have a question for you. If I was as old as Joe Namath's football number, how old would I be? Well, of course, I would be 12. And on that note, we'll have the sports. Here's WINR Sports. The Oakland A's have sold relief pitcher Paul Lindblad to the Texas Rangers, despite baseball commissioner Bowie Kuhn's edict that no such player sales be made without his approval. WINR. Oakland owner Charlie Finley, who likes to do that jingle very much, never one of Kuhn's best friends, says he'll ignore Kuhn's ruling and may just sell ace pitcher Vita Blue to the Montreal Expos. On the sports scoreboard last night in the NBA, the New York Nets came from behind to beat the New York Knicks 86-85. It was Cleveland 92, Phoenix 88, 23 points and 18 rebounds for Jim Jones. Mac Calvin signed as a free agent the other day by Denver, led the Nuggets to a 133-124 win over Portland. Some other scores, Washington 105, Detroit 95, Buffalo 103, Seattle 100, and Kansas City 115, Houston 109. In college hoop action, Anthony Roberts poured in 66 points as Oral Roberts beat North Carolina A&T 110-64. Wichita State ruined Marquette coach Al McGuire's last home game, beating the Warriors 75-64. And some other scores, Kentucky 90, LSU 76, Oregon top UCLA 666, uh, 55 rather, and it was Michigan 89, Minnesota 70. On the ice last night in the NHL, Rene Robert scored a late goal to lead Buffalo over Detroit 2 to 1. The New York Islanders smashed the Rangers by the score of 5 2. Yvonne Cornoyer scored two goals, including number 400, as Montreal beat Philly 5 to 2. Rookie Bernie Federko, he has a funny name, scored his second hat trick in only two weeks of play, as St. Louis toppled Washington 4 to 1. And Derek Sanderson, back in the NHL with Vancouver, had a goal and an assist tonight as the Canucks beat it. Atlanta 5-1. Other finals, Pittsburgh and Toronto a 6-6 tie, and Minnesota beat Chicago 6-2. And that's WINR Sports. So, I will come back to that cassette from February 1977 later on to give you a few more laughs, but now to the little story about how I saw a ghost. And it was Glenn. As I said, frenemies. I think the last conversation we actually had sometime in the 1980s 
was about the fact that I graduated on time, beating odds of probably five million to one, and he did not graduate on time. Um, that was probably an even bet. But nevertheless, at the actual graduation ceremony at Cornell with me in my cap and gown, drinking champagne at 10 o'clock in the morning with all the other graduates and just happy to get out by hook or by crook, Glenn looked up towards me and had the forlorn look of sadness that I can't quite describe. And I may have given him a popular 3,000-year-old Anglo-Saxon gesture involving fingers. Later on, in what I think was the last conversation we ever had, he said he deserved that. And I said, yes, you did. On the other hand, I shouldn't have done it. And he said, no, you probably shouldn't have. And that was it. That would have been somewhere in the 80s. Early in 1996, Glenn, who was then 39 years old, died suddenly while he was giving a lecture about radio at Cats Radio in New York. He had a hidden heart defect that could not have been identified, certainly not then, except in the autopsy. It killed him before he hit the floor. And so the rest of us, Pat and Peter and all the rest of us from that era at Cornell at WVBR, reunited, recreating a film. And as always, when you get to recreate a film, it is not the one you want. It is, in fact, the one you want the least. And it was the big chill. And so we said goodbye to Glenn. And I don't think a month has passed, maybe not a week has passed without my thinking of him. And then there was the time I saw him after he died. In 1997, Dan Patrick and I wrote a book about SportsCenter called, surprisingly enough, This is SportsCenter. And simultaneous with its publication, accidentally with its publication, I was invited to come back to Cornell for the first time in 15 years to give the graduation party, the annual graduation party speech at the graduation dinner of the Cornell Daily Sun newspaper, which I had worked for for one day in 1975 before they said, well, you have to choose between us or the radio station that you also want to work for. And I said, well, that's damn stupid, especially since the Cornell station, the radio station is just kind of a slight walk up a hill, but the one to the Cornell Daily Sun newspaper is then down a 20-minute hill and then back up a 20-minute hill. I'm going into radio. In any event, they asked me to come up and give a speech, and I arrived by car. I said, send a car for me, and I brought my stuff with me and got into the Cornell Hotel and checked in and had some time before my speech that night, and I went over to WVDR, where I had not been to see anybody, not since Glenn's death, in fact, not since 1982. It had been 15 years since I'd been there. Now I had this book. I had just done the... Boston Market commercial, which made me a lot of money, and I was, and I think it was already out then. I was going to leave ESPN to go somewhere else for even more money, and I was beginning to run into tax problems, and that sounds dull and conceited, but there's a relevance to this to the story. So I get yet to the radio station at WVBR, 227 Linden Avenue. Uh, it had not been cleaned since my last appearance there in 1982 and probably had not, in fact, been cleaned since my first appearance there in 1975. And I buzzed my way in, and the first person I saw was a man named Phil Shapiro, who was a salesman who had come to WVBR in about 1967 and never left. He managed to make a living, just barely a living, selling time on a nominally college radio station that had advertising. I won't go into the explanation as to why we had advertising. But Phil Shapiro stopped and stared at me. And he said, what are you doing here? He also did the folk show every Sunday night, the folk music live festival show, Bound for Glory, from the law school at Cornell. And he had one of those voices, and he did a lot of commercials, and he just had enough money to get by. And he said, what are you doing here? And I said, I used to work here, remember? He said, no, of course, of course, of course we remember you. What are you doing here now? I said, well, I'm up here to give the speech to the Daily Sun people, and you know, that's, of course I'm going to come over here now. I walked around campus for about five minutes, and here I am, just like the old days. He goes, no, why are you here today? And I said, I'm not getting your point. He said, we are holding a board of directors emergency meeting in one hour, and we're going to shut the radio station down for the summer. And I said, what? 
You can't shut the radio station down for the summer. It'll never go back on the air. He said, I know. I said, well, what happened? Well, now we go to the explanation as to what happened. They ran out of money, but they didn't run out of money. The place was still making advertising money enough to make a profit every year, although we couldn't keep the profit because of the hybrid nature of the radio. You don't care about this part. They had borrowed so much money in the 80s for various capital projects that the debt was killing the radio station, and the only solution they could come up with was to take the radio station off the air for the summer and then bring it back in the fall when the students came back and there were more listeners and therefore more profits to make or some profits to make, and they had a chance of paying off the debt. And we all knew that if the radio station went off the air, it would never go back on the air. They would sell the license to somebody else, carve up the money, take some sort of uh, AM carrier current radio signal and reduce this factory of broadcasters that everybody that you could think of, whoever went to Cornell and went into broadcasting, went through. They were going to take it off the air. The place that I owed my entire career to. And I sat down and listened to Phil, and he said, let me get the general manager, and they brought out this fellow from the class of 98, and we sat down in the business office. And the business office was really just big enough for four large desks, and the promotion director had a desk, and I believe the music director may have had a desk, and the program director had a desk over in the other corner. The fourth corner was saved for the copying machine. That's how small a business office it was. That far corner essentially the upper left-hand corner of this office, had been Glenn's desk. And every time for probably two years, even before he was program director of the radio station, when I would go into this office, I would see Glenn on the phone with his feet up, talking to a music rep from Los Angeles, trying to get free radio players of various kinds and uh, performances or records or leased or or tickets to concerts or something and ultimately to get himself a career in the business which i admired him for he was really good at it and it worked but i could see him then and it occurred to me as i sat down to my surprise that i could see him now not if i looked directly at the corner of what was his desk but only if I maintained my eye contact with the general manager of the radio station and with Phil Shapiro, who was basically explaining to me, the two of them were, that the radio station was going to go out of business shortly, like 45 minutes from now. And I just happened to wander in for the first time in literally 15 years on the day they were going to vote to take the radio station off the air. So that was Phil Shapiro's question. What are you doing here today? And I said, I, 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 I don't know. Now I begin, began to understand what I was doing there. Because when I did not look into the corner that had Glenn's desk in it, I could see him quite clearly with his feet up on the phone and now hanging the phone up and now putting his feet down and just sort of sitting back in the chair with his hands behind his head, rocking back and forth in that chair and smiling and smiling more and more broadly at me. And he was there. And I don't think I've ever told anybody about this, but I could see him. If I snapped over and tried to catch him, he wasn't there. If I looked at the general manager and at Phil Shapiro, he was there. And they began to explain to me the whole history of the 10 or 15 year decline of the finances of WVBR, which apparently was the last radio station in this country to try to go top 40 for some reason, in the mid-1980s. And that's where the financial problem, which was not truly a financial problem, if they could get rid of the debt, they'd be making money. I mean, it sounds academic, and for my financial acumen, which is almost nothing, it is kind of academic. But literally, if they could just wipe out this debt, but there was no way to wipe out the debt, they could never get out from under it. And that was what the meeting was about. And the votes were there to shut the radio station down, and there would be no chance it could ever resume. It had to stay on the air during the summer for, if no other reason, in the summer was when the real training was done. The people who aspired to be professionals in radio stayed in Ithaca, New York for the summer and were on the air five, six days a week as disc jockeys, as newscasters, as sportscasters, as salesmen, as running a radio station for three months in a small town. 
I did it for one summer and it doubled my ability in three months. And so everything I had owed to WBBR and I knew it and the ghost in the corner knew it too. And now I'm waiting for the punchline to this. How much money they have and how much money they owe and what the debt service is and how much money there is standing between them and the apocalypse of shutting down for the summer. And I'm waiting to hear half a million dollars, $750,000, even $300,000, something enormous. Remember, at ESPN doing SportsCenter, I never made $300,000, not in the 90s, and I was the highest paid guy doing SportsCenter. They didn't even offer me half a million dollars to stay in 1997. They're never going to pay anybody to do Sports Center for that much money. So I'm listening, and the only thing that occurred to me was, well, maybe, maybe I can throw some money at it and we can delay this a couple of weeks, maybe? Because what had happened was, because of the book, which made me some money, and that commercial when I fell off the cliff, the Boston Market commercial, which I'd made, had made me some money too. My tax guy had told me that I had to find a charitable donation to make to a nonprofit of some sort. And, and WVBR qualified as a nonprofit because of this Byzantine tax structure and legal status granted by it, uh, the FCC to it in 1939. It had those properties, but what good would it be if they needed $10 million? I had to give away, according to my accountant, about $50,000 or just give it to the IRS. So he said, be on the lookout. You have about a month to make up your mind. And I listened to this nightmare. I listened to Glenn's radio station about to go off the air and Peter's radio station and Pat's radio station and my radio station going off the air because, among other things, I hadn't paid any attention to it for 15 years. And Joyce Brothers worked at that radio station. Not with me. She was some years before. And I listened to this, and in the corner of my eye, in the corner of the office, I could see Glenn. And I what I could not understand about this, it made absolute perfect sense to me that Glenn Cornelius's ghost would be in the corner of the business office at WVBR in my first appearance there in 15 years when I happened somehow to have been driven there in one hour shy of the moment that they were going to take the radio station off the air. That I happened to be there that day, I could understand why Glenn's ghost would be standing there or sitting there in the corner staring at me. What I could not understand was why he had a smile on his face. This did not seem to make any sense. That was the part that disturbed me. Not that I could see him, even though he had been dead for more than a year. Not that part. It was that he was smiling at me. That's when I cut to the chase with Phil Shapiro and the general manager of the radio station. I said, how much do you need? And I'm waiting for the answer, 379000 for, And the guy goes, well, I haven't checked it today. And I'm thinking, oh, my God, it goes up every day. Oh, my God, why is Glenn laughing at this? It can't possibly be something I can help with. It'll be a drop in the bucket even if I have to. He said, but I think the last time I looked earlier in the week, it was $49,983. Now I saw Glenn's ghost burst into laughter. Silently, of course. I burst into laughter, full volume. I said, say that again. It was 49,927 cents. And I said, okay, you're not shutting down the radio station on my watch. Can you keep it open until tomorrow morning without any help? Well, I suppose... I said, okay, because here's the deal. My accountant wants me to give away $50,000 in the next month. And I happen to be here an hour before the meeting at which you're going to shut down because you don't have $50,000. So here's what I propose to do. In addition to the fact that I had to pay 
for the limo to take me up here from New York. And I thought it was going to be one check for the trip up and one check for the trip back. In fact, they demanded the round trip in advance. So when I got out of the car an hour ago, I had to give them a round trip fee on one check. I still have one of my corporate checks back in the hotel. So I have a check, a blank check, and I have a need to give away $50,000, which is slightly more than you need by about 13 bucks. So here's what I want. I want you to rename that studio over there where you do most of the music programming from. I need you to rename that after Glenn. And I want a party tomorrow with cake. And I want balloons. And I want this announcement to run just once. You're listening to WVBR-FM 93.5 Ithaca, New York, an Olbermann Broadcasting Empire station. You only have to run it once. And they went, what? And Phil Shapiro went white as a sheet. I said, I'm giving you the money you need. How's that? Can you stay open until tomorrow without it? Because I have it back in my room, and I really don't want to go over there and come back again today. I'll come back tomorrow. I mean, I'm not criticizing anybody. None of you are the ones who are responsible for turning this into an, a top 40 radio station in 1985. That wasn't your fault. It's 1996. Those people are long gone from this radio station. I said, okay, can you, can you just not shut down my station, Glenn's radio station? Can you just stay on the air? and stay in business till tomorrow morning. And Phil Shapiro, who I thought was going to faint, and I'm thinking, oh, great, now there'll be two ghosts in this room. Phil went, I think we can handle it. What do you think? And the general manager just looked at me like, oh, thank God, how did you come here today? I went, I I, I looked over in the corner of the room, and there was no ghost anymore. And I said, someday I'll explain it to you. The radio station survived. They managed to keep it open till the next day, and then we had a party, and then they put up a plaque that called it the Glenn Cornelius Memorial Studio, and then they got into other problems that really were not their fault, where we had to build them a new studio in about 2010 or so, and there was a little bit more money circulating through my life, so I helped them out there too. And now they operate from a much nicer multimedia facility called the Olbermann Cornelius Studios, which I claim are named after Glenn and after my father, because my father put in such effort to getting me into that place in the first time and into Cornell in the first place. But obviously it also the other Olbermann in the equation is me. But it's Olbermann Cornelius rather than Cornelius Olbermann, because as I think Glenn would have agreed with me, the damnedest part of this would have been if somebody someday had thought there was actually somebody named Cornelius Olbermann, so we wouldn't have that, neither he nor I. And so it is now, today, the Olbermann Cornelius Studios. But I saw him laughing his ass off. Something put me in that studio an hour before they were going to go out of business, after not being there for 15 years nor worrying about their financial status. Something put me in that studio having to give away $50,000 for tax purposes when they needed just slightly less than that. I'm happy to say that they spent the additional $13 on the cake. I saw him. Didn't hear him. Didn't ask him questions. Didn't say anything. I saw him. And then The other day I found this cassette. All right, that's what I like to see. A record that's hop, skipping, and jumping there. All the young dudes, just listen to this, folks. Wait, that wasn't your cue. Hold it. We're not quite ready yet. Time out. One, two, okay, here we go. Wait, don't go yet. Well, it's three and a half minutes before two o'clock. We're WINR Binghamton. My name is Tom Daniels, and we're going off the air in a very little while. I'll be back tomorrow morning, maybe, at 10 o'clock, and I'll be here through four. Dandy Don Morgan in at four o'clock. And now, this message. WINR! 
Well, the world may never recover from this. I certainly won't ever recover from this. Um, but Al Stewart's going to come, and he's going to sing a song. And this is entertaining. It's a nice song to go to bed to. It's all about the year of the cat. Good morning, Decisive action here if Hurricane doesn't watch out. And I told you, you weren't nice. Well, the views and opinions expressed by this activity do not particularly reflect the opinions or the views of anyone, most especially Keith or Peter or Pat or anybody else like that. 13 before 1 o'clock at WINR. That was a little bit of Hurricane Smith. Luckily, not a whole lot, though. Eagles are here. done all the damage i can do here thank you for listening countdown musical directors brian ray and john philip chanel arranged produced and performed most of our music mr ray on guitars bass and drums mr chanel handled orchestration and keyboards produced by tko brothers i saw him he was a ghost other music including some of the beethoven compositions were arranged and performed by the group no horns allowed the sports music is the Olbermann theme from ESPN2, written by Mitch Warren Davis, courtesy of ESPN Inc. Our satirical and pithy musical comments are by Nancy Faust, the best baseball stadium organist ever. Our announcer today was my friend Larry David. Everything else was pretty much my fault. Could I have not really seen him and just seen him in my mind's eye? Eh. That's Countdown for this, the 211th day until the 2024 presidential election the 1,190th day since Dementia J. Trump's first attempted coup against the democratically elected government of the United States. Use the 14th Amendment and the not regularly given elector objection option. Use the Insurrection Act, the justice system, the mental health system to stop him from doing it again while we still can. The next scheduled countdown is tomorrow. Bulletins as the news warrants. Till then, I'm Keith Olbermann. Good morning, good afternoon, good night, and good luck.